Welcome to Backstage with Becca B with special guest Kristen Stokes. Hi everyone and welcome to this episode of Backstage with Becca B. On this episode, you might know the specific Conservatory of Performing Arts grad as Annabeth in The Lightning Thief, where she earned a Drama Desk nomination and participated in the off-Broadway production, the national tour, and the Broadway production of the show. Please welcome Kristen Stokes. How are you? How have you been during this time? Because it's been like a weird time and you're in theater, so it's like it's affected you, I'm sure. In a oh, huge way. Of course, of course. Um, you know, it's been interesting. I think um, probably like a lot of artists, but there's like a lot of soul searching. I think that happens, you know, you're already, you just can't help it no matter how, where you are on like the success chain of like artistic endeavors. Every time you're like not in a show again, you're like, oh my God, what am I doing with my life? Like it already, you already do that. And so it was like twofold. It was like one, uh, my brain was like, oh, this is just that period between shows. So like, I know what to do. I like do my own projects and this and that and blah, 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 blah. But then it was like, it wasn't even until like November where my brain was like, oh, this is different than like between shows, you know? Um, and then of course, you know, it's just the usual like, okay, should I be doing other things? Like, what else can I be doing? But, 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 but I mean, I just always come back to, I love being creative. And so that's, I mean, honestly, that's what I've been doing during the pandemic. I've done some Zoom readings. I've done some like full out Zoom plays and productions. I've been, you know, playing the guitar, doing my like, I had a thing called Quarantine Tuesday where I would do a song every Tuesday. Yes. I was baking and doing yoga, that, you know, so. There's a lot going on. Yeah, we've entertained ourselves in theater. People are resilient. Uh, yes, a hundo percent. Yeah, they find ways. Did you get on the banana bread trend earlier in quarantine? Not earlier, but uh, recently, yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was staying at a friend's house during that, and I don't cook, but her mom did, and, I, and she made banana bread, like, every day, and I was like, oh, okay, my I'm, I'm going to move in with you all permanently. Hold on. <laughs> I mean, I was baking every Sunday and very soon that much baking and like you can't share it with anyone. And then plus you like can't leave your house. I was like, I need to slow my roll on the baking. It's not going to be cute. <laughs> hey, but we're all stuck inside. So it's like. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And like maybe going on walks to stay sane. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, we um, I was actually I was living with. um. Sarah Beth, who was in Lightning Thief with me, uh -huh. and then um, her fiance, now wife, and we adopted a dog very early on. We were like, we well, it was a foster fail. We were like, all these dogs, they need homes. Like, oh my god! Like, uh, and so we like fostered a dog, and then like less than a weekend, we're like, this is the most perfect dog that's ever existed. Like, no one else should like be with him except for us. So that was like a way that we had to get out at least like three to four times every day to give him walks, you know? Yes, exactly. So I want to get in back into theater because uh, have you always known that you wanted to be a theater performer and like be on stage and entertain people for a living? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, is kind of the easy answer. I mean, um, yeah, I feel like a lot of people, I don't know, they had that moment when they were like watching a show or, you know, later on in college, they were like, I found my people or this and that. I was just like, from the jump, I love performing. I love musicals. I love being on stage. I love the community. I love being creative. There was just like, never a question for me that I was like, oh, this is the most fun. Why wouldn't I just like have the most fun all the time, you know, and make it a career? I mean, I was, um, I grew up in a family. My mom, she did theater when she was younger. And so that translated to us kids because she always had musicals playing in the car. So like, that's how I knew every word to like every show ever by the time I was like nine. Um, and then she decided to like kind of dip her toe back into theater um, when I was like nine or ten because um, she hadn't been doing it because she was like raising three kids. And then she was like, oh, I'm like a little nervous. It's 
my first time back and she was like Kristen there's like a kid part would you want to do it and like I was just like I don't know what it was inside me but like I would be like I'm a kindergarten and I'm doing the talent show and they're like uh kindergartners can't do the talent show and I was like watch me like just yeah. stupid stupid so my mom was like why did you come audition with me and I was just like uh, okay um and we did a show um at like the local college it was called working by stud turkle and the music is steven schwartz um, yeah it's a really cool show it's about people and the jobs that they have um and uh, i played a newsboy which was really fun and it was great because i um i was surrounded by adults but they weren't like adults they weren't like the scary like i'm very serious you know it was kind of my first exposure to being around adults all the time and they were just as playful just as silly just as fun and i was like one adults are just like kids but they grew up love that two <laughs> this is so much fun and you know i think i mean if that was the moment it was doing my first show and being like this is incredible i love the smell of a theater. I love being backstage in the dark. I love tech. I love the tediousness of it. I just, I mean, I could go on forever. <laughs> and like as a kid, the adults, even if they are more like kids in your eyes, like the adults are also inspirations to you when they're in the show with you. So it was probably, yeah. like, they're probably like, whoa, they're so good. Totally. Oh my God, totally. I did um, Gypsy when I was 14 um, at this professional theater company in the Bay, San Francisco Bay Area, which is where I grew up. And every show, I would just stand in the wings and watch the woman playing Mama Rose sing Rose's turn every night. I was just like, this is incredible. This is absolutely incredible. Yeah, I, I want to do this for the rest of my life and just watch people sing and watch. Yeah, people. I'm like, how great is that? I have front row tickets, sorry. Yeah, right there. I'm like, I get to be, you know, watching these people do it. This is the best scene in the house. And doing what you love too, like simultaneously. Totally, totally. It's the best. So you went to Pacific Conservatory of Performing Arts, I saw. Is that in California or? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, yes. So that obviously had, a, had was a reason you went there because it was close by home. Mm -hmm. But why? Why else did you go there and why did it like the program stand out to you and what did you learn from there that like helped you with your career in the future? Great questions. Um, I, um, I was really interested in the program for a number of reasons. One, it was a two year conservatory. So it was like affiliated with a college, but this was its own individual program. So it's, it was kind of like a graduate program, but because it was affiliated with this junior college, that's how they were able to have this conservatory. And, you know, as long as you have, you can attend junior college, like you can attend this conservatory. Now at the time, they were making it a big deal that like, oh, usually people after college, they like attend their four years and then they come here for their like extensive, you know, conservatory graduate level training. You know, so like, don't expect if you're like in high school that you're gonna get in right away. And I was like, okay, well, that's a challenge. Now I must, I now I must get in. And so I'm like, I'm a November birthday person. And so I'm like, so my even more, okay, then, you know, she knows it's like, yeah. although I don't think they do, they allow you to do that anymore. But like, I was younger than everyone else in my grade because of my late birthday. And so, um, I was 17 when I went there, which I was like, do, 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 do. So that was, that was like super fun. So I kind of went there because they said I couldn't that young. And, but mostly because I was like, this has incredible, incredible training. And that's what I want to do and focus on. And I was torn between going to the full, full four year college experience and all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, I was like, that's a lot of money to eventually get to like a little bit of training when I would rather cut to the chase and get to the training because that's what I know I want to do. So that's kind of why I went. And and that, I mean, and that is what I got. I just got incredible, incredible acting training. I'm also curious because I feel like you've, based on your resume, you've stuck around the West Coast 
mm -hmm. more than the East Coast. Lightning Thief obviously brought you to the East Coast, but why did you choose to like stay more on the West Coast and stay more, stay closer to home rather than venture out and go to the East Coast where like theater, there's Broadway and everything? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, actually, so yes and no. So I moved to the East Coast um shortly after college okay. but i had so many ties and connections to the west coast that i just kept getting hired back and one of the biggest things that i would come back to the west coast for um was this um thing called the new works festival and that's just where tons of honestly new york people would come to the west coast as theater company to try out all their new plays and musicals so i was I did that for, I don't even know, just, I was just a person that they would always call up. And so I made so many East Coast connections working here on the West Coast. And that is how I met Stephen Brackett, which eventually, you know, he was the one who brought me into Lightning Thief. And, um, but you know, yeah, I was, I was doing some things on the East Coast, but it just, you know, I just always kept getting called back. So I was living in Brooklyn, but then, you know. And it was kind of a meant to be thing because you had the connection that brought you into the Lightning Thief from the from the New York Festival. Exactly, exactly. If I would have fought that and been like, no, I am living on the East Coast. I can't do anything on the West Coast. I must do this. I was like, okay, I mean, this is, I just love doing new plays and musicals. And I love that theater company. And they were just like, you know, it was like I was a resident artist always for that festival. They always had me in mind and I was like, that's incredible. And it was it's because of that festival that I have so many connections and I worked with so many incredible writers and directors and like Anna Gasteyer, like from Saturday Night Live. Like there's just so many people I worked with because of this, you know, West Coast Festival. And and, you know, I hear a lot I've heard a lot of actors and people say like, oh, I don't know how to break into the to the new musicals because, you know, it's it's hard to originate something. And so you kind of have to take that leap of faith and just um, follow the projects that you want to do. And that's how you do it. You just get in on the very yeah. seed of it, you know. And you get to watch the projects grow and grow from that. Yeah. Like, even if you don't participate in them the whole time, if you're with them at the beginning stages, I feel like how much do they grow in a workshop stage from like from day to day? I mean, it, it can be crazy. It can be crazy. I mean, especially with that festival, it was such great training because I would have shows where I was like memorizing or had time or, or, you know, or, you know, you have to have your book cause it's a workshop, but you're like, eh, I have to memorize this. So, you know, I'd have like pages and pages and pages and like a whole song or this and that. And you're trying to, you know, lace the inner working so that all goes together. And then like, you'll go to lunch and then literally they'll be like, okay, tear out 20 pages. That song is cut. Da, da, da. And you just have to be like, okay. And that doesn't exist anymore. And erase that from my story mind. And like, you know, you just can't be precious about anything. And it really teaches you to just kind of, work what's in front of you and you know roll with the punches and not take anything personally like if your song gets cut you can't be like oh god i'm the worst singer in the world oh god you just have to be like oh, that didn't serve the story next maybe something else will have you ever had a song that you're like particularly upset got cut because like you grew to love it so much oh gosh yes I'm sure I have. I mean, it's happened a lot. Um, I had, there was a show that I did called Fly By Night, and that's probably a musical that I worked on the longest next to Lightning Thief. I think I worked on that show for like five years and four different reiterations, like your companies and blah, blah, blah. And there was a song uh top of act one that was like really beautiful and was a solo and that they cut but on the flip for lightning thief for instance like annabeth didn't have a song and i came in one day we did a a two-day workshop this is when they were first trying to expand the show 
from a one hour to a two hour. And um, I came in and they were like, oh, P.S., we wrote a song for you. And I was like, you're like, what? Oh. Yay! You know? and so and then and of course that changes like there was an intro the all the words were different keys there's this there's that you know and then rob he also wrote he kind of wrote two songs actually he wrote grand plan and then he wrote that song take the weight if you've heard that and so he wrote kind of two songs for annabeth depending which one fits into the story more so I just heard Rob sing Take the Weight. I didn't even get to learn it, and then it was cut. So sometimes that happens. <laughs> I was interested in Fun Night because I saw that that was in Dallas, where I'm actually living right now more than California because oh, really? I'm moving back until I can get a job in California. But, um, yeah, I, I was like, oh, that's close to me. <gasps> and Have you ever been to Dallas Theater Center? I have, but not recently because I've been based in California for like six years. Oh, wow. Cool. So, California? Uh, Studio City. Okay, nice. Cool. Right close to Pantages and stuff. Yeah. The fun. I worked there for like six months before this all hit as an usher, which was fun. Wow. Very cool. So I want to get into Lightning Thief. Because obviously that show has a huge fan base and I feel like everyone knows your name because Lightning Thief and everyone's like, like the fans are just like, the fans on social media are incredible, which I feel has to do a lot with how well it's marketed via the social media platforms. Mm -hmm. The person behind the account, I don't know who it is and I don't know if you know, but whoever that is, is genius. They are. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, when did you get the audition for Lightning Thief and what was your audition experience like? Um, so I was literally, I was in one of those like, oh, I haven't done a, a big show in a while spell. So I was like, oh, should I be doing this with my life again? It was one of those, like we talked about at the beginning. And I was literally at the actor's um, at the like uh, Actors Fund, they have like a career center. And I was there being like, okay, like what other jobs should I be looking into? Not for like a career change, but I don't know, maybe blah, blah, blah. And then I came out of that, literal that, that, sen that seminar, I came out of it and I had a voicemail on my phone and I was like, what is this? Who is this number? Listen to the message. And it was like, hi, this is so-and-so from TheaterWorks USA, and we have an audition appointment set up for you. It's for the show called The Line of Faith. And, blah, blah, blah. and I was like, what is it? And I'm like on the New York streets. And I'm like, how did I? I'm like, I have an audition. And I was like, okay, well, if that isn't a sign from the universe, I don't know what it is. That was incredible. And so I was like, I have no idea what show she just said, uh, but I have an audition. So like, sure why not cool i called them back i confirmed um they sent me the sides i was still like this is a mystery like how did you get my name and number like you have my phone number like how did that happen weird um i did not have an agent um so it was completely completely random and um and when I looked at the sides, and they weren't like really talking about what the title was. It was like the lightning project or something like that. So I was like, I don't know what this is. And then the scene was the scene with Auntie M. And so I was like, oh, this is like a Wizard of Oz thing. Like, I'm not really sure what this is. And so I'm literally in the like waiting room before the audition starts and I'm like looking over my material and being like, okay, here we go. And then in walks Stephen Brackett, the director. And so I had worked on a show with him like a year and a half before that. And he was like, Stokes, oh my God. And I was like, okay, Steven, is this why I'm here? And he was like, yes, 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 yes. I gave him your number. Um, we just needed someone with like a high rock belt. You're the only person I could think of. So I have you come in. Let me give you a quick synopsis. You're the daughter of Athena and you're like really tough and smart. Okay, I'll see you in there. Dry humor. Bye. And I was like, okay, what am I going to do now? And then it was like five minutes later, they're like, Kristen. And I was like, yeah, totally ready totally ready and I just went in and I just kind of 
based off of what Stephen said, I just had to completely trust that, completely trust the script and just kind of, you know, yeah. basically. And um, it worked out in my favor. And then they were like, we're never letting you go. So that was nice. <laughs> You've been with the show since. I was with the show since. It's exactly. Again, another tiny two-week workshop that was had no intentions or foresight or anything that it would go on tour, go on Broadway, um, and be the phenomenal thing that it turned out to be. So, And I saw someone said on social media that you had never read the books pre-auditioning for it. Did you watch the movies pre-auditioning for it, or did you just have no clue what it was? I had no concept of what I was auditioning for. I had no idea. I was like, oh, it's a book? Like, this is afterwards. Like, this is like after Stephen told me all that. And then when they were like, oh, you got it. And then I was like, oh, it's based off of a book series. Okay, let me look this up. And I was like, oh, that's right. I remember these, there was like these movies. And then I was like, oh, this is a whole thing that just, that I got. Okay, interesting. And, um, and also being in it from the beginning, there wasn't this like buzz and pressure around it yet. Like I was just had no idea how how it was about to grow. You know what I mean? Like people coming into it like Jarrell, that's nerve wracking because Jarrell, it, huge fan of the books growing up. Anyone. Um, huge fan of our album, apparently. He was already a fan of the show. He already was like getting people being like, oh, you should do George Salazar type things, you know? And then he got the audition for the national tour straight out of college. And he was like, I was shaking in my boots. I was like, like that would be 5 million times harder. I feel like as opposed to me being like, what's this? Oh, hey, Steven. Oh, a two week, just whatever workshop. Sure. Why not? Boop, 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 boop. Which is also why it's great to get in on the ground level because it's like, minimal pressure <laughs> and it probably helped you that you didn't know much about it or anything about it at all because you really got to like put your own spin on the character you were auditioning for absolutely i got to i had not seen the movies thank god and um and i got to you know read and experience the books for the first time knowing that i was about to dive into this world and so it was just, it was so exciting. The first time I read, you know, The Lightning Thief, the first book, I was like at home. I think I got through it in like, I don't know, how many days? At least a week, if not under, because I was just like yeah. engrossed. And then I was like, I remember it was some like scary scene and I was at home by myself and I was like, I can't read this anymore, I'm too scared. Like, it was just, ugh, it was the best. That's why I'm watching the movie when they like wander into the uh, into the forest. Oh, I'm losing the name of the person with the snake heads in the, in the movie, uh -huh. and they and they like all are like getting almost getting captured by her. Yeah. Like, oh my god, I can't watch anymore. <laughs> it's too creepy. It's freaky. It's a it's a it's a pretty scary uh, <laughs> little production there. Yeah. Yeah. So. How was the show different than the books and the movies? And how was it like more the same? Like obviously there were songs added to it, which weren't in the movie, right. which wasn't in the movie. And obviously aren't in the books because you can't write songs for people <laughs> like, like that doesn't happen, but, but yeah. Uh, well, you know what, I, TBH, I still have not watched the movies. Gotta watch. So I saw, there's like a picture frame literally being like, that's the sun in my eye. Oh. <laughs> uh, but I did see like the very beginning, like one day on TV and I was like, what is this? So I have to say that we're unlike the movies because from the like first five minutes that I saw of the first movie, they went very like serious hunger games dramatic it, like type of story and that's not us at all we're way more like the books as far as tone which is like really silly doesn't ever take itself too seriously super imaginative um 
the like quick kind of like dry humor that they have. And also, you know, the first book, there is no love story or anything like that. It's about friendship and it's about, you know, a boy realizing who he is and stepping into his power, you know, and, and same with all the characters for both Annabeth and Grover, they are also stepping into their power and realizing who they kind of truly are. And, um, and I, and I believe in the movies, they're like beat one trying to have like some type of romantic thing going on between Percy and Annabeth or something like that. And we were just like, no, that's not what this is about at all, which is great. It's so refreshing to be in a show, especially as a female, because that's like, it's, I mean, 99% of the time, if not 100, you are like, okay, who do I like in the show? I'm the romantic interest. There's some type of blah, and so it was just so great to be like, um, I'm awesome. I'm badass. I fight monsters. I'm smart. That's what I do in this show. Awesome, you know. Um, the, you know, I think a few things. We obviously couldn't take everything from the book and put it into the musical. I mean, it's just we had to, like, forego that. I think most of the plot points, we didn't change anything. We had to, like, piece things together because we had to, like, cut huge scenes. But for the most part, all that was very consistent. And then, I mean, I think the biggest thing besides, you know, it's a rock musical and, and stuff is um, there's only seven people in the cast. So everyone's playing multiple characters. And, um, and then we didn't cast 12-year-olds. <laughs> you know, it's kind yeah. of, it, we, we did the like spelling bee thing or the Peter and the star catcher thing or whatever, where we're like, okay, obviously this isn't going to be, you know, we didn't go like the Matilda route or school of rock where they actually have like real little kids. We went kind of the, the other way with it. Yeah. And I feel like it works because like these, these people are like, I mean, I guess in the movies they're portrayed like more teenagerish. Yeah. So, so that kind of works anyways. Yeah, yeah. We kind of went, I mean, I don't know. We, we, we weren't trying, you, know, you just have to, especially in theater, you can't be like, and now I'm playing a kid. Da -da -da. Yeah. You, know, you just have to kind of trust what the writing is and the circumstances your characters are in. And that tells the audience how old they are, what their experience is, you know. And so that's kind of where we put ourselves. And that rapport and like maturity or immaturity really comes from your interactions with your characters, you know. And so we understood that like, okay, these are like 12 year olds. And that's something like we honestly as a cast like try to harness but we weren't going to go over the top and be like because you know how 12 year olds are 12 year olds are like i'm a person I'm reacting how i'm going to react they don't know that their reactions are can like uh, received like more you know younger or something like that and 12 year olds 12 year olds are mature and they want to see yeah. themselves they want to see themselves played as mature. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because it would be insulting to be like, oh my God, I played a 12 year old. No, you want to be, give everyone the benefit of the doubt and play them, you know, to their strengths. I mean, yeah, I, I, I totally, I totally agree with that. And at 12, you're also like starting to reach like the, like the peak of like your teenage, like your kid years and yeah. going into your teenage years, going into adulthood. Like, right. So much to figure out and so much to dive into and and it is they're just really rich characters and yeah you don't ever want to dumb it down you want to just play to the smartest person in the house you want to make your character as smart as possible because they are they are the smartest person in their world and they know as much as they can you know and then I, and which is why it's kind of fun to have adults playing younger because you know there's that added perspective to be able to like go back and zoom in. And then also, you know, we're playing like demigods and goddesses. So literally the show is crazy, cuckoo kachoo, exhausting with all the fighting and the belting and the this and the that. Like after you finish that show, you feel like a demigod because you're like, I just did that. It's so intense, it's so intense. And so I think just also for longevity, stamina, skill, 
you know, they couldn't hire 12 year olds. And yes. I'm glad. <laughs> I want to get into that stamina because like, I always love asking how act actors and actresses have stamina to perform mm -hmm. the shows eight times a week, like they do on Broadway and tours. But first, Lightning Thief kind of had a different, like kind of went a different way after the off-Broadway production and it went to tour before it went to Broadway, which mm -hmm. like normally it's Broadway and then tour. How do you think it going on tour first maybe strengthened the audience's reaction to it when it got to Broadway and like strengthened the support that you all got from the fans? Um, I think, yeah, that was exactly the purpose of going on tour. You know, there's so much love for this show and so many people that, you know, couldn't get to New York to see it off Broadway. And it has such a huge fan base and following. It was really important for us to kind of get the family together, so to speak, you know, get out on the road, go to these places, kind of be like, hey, everyone, we're here. We got you. We understand what this show is like, join us kind of a thing. Um, and so it was really amazing because our audience has always been and this is actually the motto of the theater company that started this project, Theater Works USA, they're all about um, one doing like young adult novels and books and stuff like that, bringing those like literature characters and beloved heroes to life on stage, which is huge. When you read a book, you are so attached to these people and then to see them on stage live, it just is mind blowing. And also, um, so many people, this was their first theater experience. And that is also kind of the MO of TheaterWorks USA is, you know, they always have a, they always do kind of their new latest and big show off Broadway. Um, and they, it's free, it's free theater. They give out tickets, they bus people in who have never seen shows before. And so that was also kind of, it's just more in line with how theater works has always done their shows, which is they tour them around the country um, to expose people to theater for the first time. And we had so many people who were like, I was a fan of the books. I had no idea. This was my first musical experience. This was my first theater experience. Oh my gosh, you know? And so that was so incredible and magical. And then just to like meet all the fans and, and go to places where a lot of shows don't tour, you know, or or they're used to like gigantic, big, like blah, flashy, duh, duh, duh. and we were like, we're coming in and we're like very minimal. This show is about the story. So, and the music is like rocking. That's our spectacle. Our spectacle is the music and the story. It's, you know, we have like cool props and special effects, but it's not like the full blown like Miss Saigon or whatever. You know, we don't have a helicopter that we're touring with, you know, we have plenty. Yeah. <laughs> and so it was just very it was just important to us and then it was so magical and unexpected frankly that we got to have our 16 weeks on Broadway what was your reaction when you heard about the 16 weeks on Broadway it was crazy I was okay first of all it was like we were entering our last week of tour so we were all like this is the end oh god like already and then I got a, I had a missed call from the lead producer on my phone. This is like one day before one of the shows. We were in Boston and um, his name was Carl. And he was like, Kristen, um, give me a call back as soon as you get this, we really need to talk. And I was like, oh my God, what did I do? Like, what's happening? Like, I was like, am I in trouble? Like, what, how, like, you know, it's like the principal called you. And I'm like, what did I do? Like. What, what does he need to talk about? So seriously, it was very serious. And then um, I call him back and he's like, oh, thanks for calling me back. This isn't anything like, cra uh, you know, this isn't your, like basically he was like, this is great news, but like, um, what are you doing um, in the fall? Are you busy? And I was like, mm, no, why? And he was like, well, we're gonna be doing Lightning Thief at the Long Acre and blah, 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 or the Long Acre wants us to do it. And then he just kind of kept going. And I'm on the phone being like, Long Acre, Long Acre, Long Acre, what regional what? theater is that? Like, I thought it was a regional theater that I was like trying to figure out, where have I heard that name? What city is the Long Acre in? And I was like, oh, cool, like another 
stop or like, okay, we have like a cool sit down at some theater company or whatever. And then I was like, Carl, 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 because he just like kept going. And um, he was like, it's gonna be 16 weeks and blah, 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 blah. And I was like, wait, 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 where, where is the Long Acre? What town is that in? And he was like, um, it's Broadway, Kristen. You're going to Broadway. And I was like, wait, what? I was like, Carl, that's what you start off with. You say, congratulations, you're going to Broadway. That's how you start this conversation. I was, and then I was just like, oh my God, I was shaking. I was just like, it was surreal. It was surreal. And of course, nothing is final until contracts are signed. And so um, it was like, the craziest thing and then like they couldn't tell everyone at the same time so it was like a few people got to know and then a few more so then it was kind of like a thing for like a day or two where it was like you talk to anybody today no okay cool <laughs> you know like or like crit it would be like me chris and the music director we were like the only people who knew at one point and so we'd be in my dressing room on the dressing room floor being like oh my god I'm so, I'm so, I'm so. you know it was it was magical. And then when it was like actually final, I was like, it, I mean, it's a dream come true. It's always been a dream of mine. And so it was, um, it was incredible. Do you remember the day you made your Broadway debut? Because it was most of the cast, if not all of the cast Broadway debut. Chris, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, so that's exciting. That's like a huge party and a huge celebration. Oh my God. It was a crazy celebration. I mean, it's really cool because they do, there's a um, tradition that actually I didn't know, but it was a, it just recently got started where um, if this is your first Broadway show, you like come and you like sign something and everyone goes, welcome to Broadway, Kristen. And then you like stand in the circle and the whole company, everyone goes like, yeah, you know? And so it's you have, like your own little kind of like, I've made it ceremony on stage. And you know, it was crazy. It was amazing to, you know, we're our cast and our crew. I mean, the entire company, we are so, um, bonded and connected and it's such a strong it was such a strong company because a lot of us had been with the show for a long time we all had our like blood sweat and tears in this show and so for so many of us to just be on stage as a as a group of friends being like we are all stepping into like our dreams coming true at the same moment it was just it's like too good to be true it was. It honestly was. We were like, is this really happening? And then, you know, and then it's opening night and you're getting dressed up and you're like walking the red carpet and you're getting interviewed by all the like Broadway.com people and this and that. And you're just like, I don't even, it's crazy. It was crazy. You're like, is anything better than this? No. Yeah. That, that's how I thought. I was like, and I, uh, I'm at peak. I'm at the pinnacle. What happens now? And it's like a character that you you have originated on the stage. So how has the character, how did the character grow, in your opinion, from off-Broadway to national tour to Broadway? Oh my God, great question. And yes, just really quick to your other point, that was what was also so kooky. I was like, oh, maybe one day I'll make it to Broadway as in like an understudy or a swing. In my wildest dreams, I'd like to be a lead. And in my super wildest dreams, I'd love to originate someone. And to have it all happen, a lead originating a, an original role on Broadway, I was like, I don't, this is, it, it was mind blowing. Um, Annabeth, for me, she changed, for me, internally, a lot. Um, and maybe, I don't know, I don't want that to be misleading. It's not like she had an accent and was like, my name is Annabeth, yeah. now she's Annabeth. You know, it wasn't like that crazy. She always like had her foundation. Um, but I think the biggest um, change that, or metamorphosis that I had to go through in order to, I think, be in true alignment with Annabeth is, um, you know, Annabeth is strong she's tough as nails and i think because she spent so much of her life at camp half blood like since she was what i think seven is when she arrives you know she didn't 
and she spent and she's there year round. So she does not go home. So she has no exposure to, um, I would say like hierarchy and how people are treated almost in the real world, especially girls. And so there's something special and untouched about Annabeth where she's just like, well, why wouldn't I be the captain of the capture the flag team? Why wouldn't I be the leader? Why wouldn't I be in a group of guys and say my opinion as strongly and as loudly as them? She doesn't have that thing that I didn't even know that I had. It was almost like something that was invisible that I, through Annabeth, I kept running against because I kept trying to soften her edges. I kept trying to make her a little bit more likable. And that was like my own weird opinion and the way that I had been conditioned throughout my life to make myself and my strong, sharp, I know what I want opinions more palatable to people and especially the men in the room, you know, there's like, yeah, I just think um, it, it was a blind spot and I kept running into it every time I'd come back to the character and more and more that kind of got peeled away until eventually at the end I was like, oh, like I, I, I just found such freedom in not giving a shit anymore. And that's kind of how Annabeth is. She's like, I do not care if you like me right now. That is not my top priority. And I was like, wow, how kind of life changing is that? And so that was kind of my journey with her. And then, you know, I just was able to fit more and more into her skin, the more I kind of released that likability factor and just be like, she is likable. The end. She's not trying to do that, you know? Did you learn a lot about yourself through growing the character? Oh, my God. Yeah. I mean, that, that was huge. That was a huge, 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 huge thing for me. And, I mean, by the end, I'm sure even Steven and the people who worked on the show, they could tell from the beginning, like, me having ideas and opinions. Because I always – I mean, that's where Annabeth and I are very much the same. I – absolutely have ideas. I'm quick to think I can play the chess in my head and I'm like, no, I know how this strategy is going to end out. So I need to do this and blah, 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 blah. You know, we're very much the same in that way. But I kind of was holding myself back a little bit. And then by the end, I was like, actually in the book, this is what, blah, 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 blah. You know, like I just fully gave in. I was just like, I just gave in. And then people would be like, okay, Miss, like, you know, dramaturg over here. And and then it turned into a strength. Like, anytime we had interviews or there was an audience question about the book or anything, everyone would be like, Stokes, what do you have to say? Chris was like, don't leave my side. We are always going to be interviewing together. I always got sent out on all the things because, you know, that was just my propensity to be like, I will read and know everything about the lightning thief, this character, this and that. And I just wasn't hiding it anymore. And it probably made the fans so happy because it probably made, it pro probably helped you connect with the fans even more and like, and get the chance to like kind of fan roll along with the fans. Oh my God. Totally. Totally. I'm also a fan of Anna, Annabeth. And then it, to have us be able to share that love of her is like, is so fun and that they get her. And then it's, I mean, obviously it's such an honor yes. that everyone thinks that I do a good job with her basically, you know, and that they're like, we trust you with her. And that just means the world to me. Do you have a favorite fan moment slash stage door moment? Oh my God. Uh, let me go back into the recesses of my mind. Oh, uh, I mean, I'm sure there's so many. There's honestly, there's so many. Okay, these are like the the few that are like coming to my head. I think um, when we were at the Lortel, because that was a small theater, that was where we did Off-Broadway. The first time we came back uh, like out the stage door and there was a line of fans screaming for us. We were like, we had no idea. And it didn't stop. It was not just one night. It was the entire run. And we were like, oh my, it was like, it was my first experience experiencing that type of pandemonium and people like making shirts, you know, and coming back multiple times and this and that. And I was just like, oh my God, that's incredible. People would write letters, you know, and like slip notes to me and be like, this means the world to me. And I was just like, this is incredible. I mean, every, you know, and that continued throughout the entire show. There were so many notes that I got 
from girls who are just like, I look up to Annabeth so much and this, you know, she really gives me the strength to be myself and thank you for portraying that and this and that. And, you know, it's, I read all of those and they're all, they just really, really mean the world to me. I love um, seeing like, especially like really little girls, like uh, really like fan out. Chris would always tell me because Chris has like a front row seat to my grand plan which is my song. And he, you know, he's like paying attention to me, but he's like really not because he's also actually Percy and like cannot focus. And so he's like always like peeping in the audience, usually during the top of grand plan. And he always talks about how that's his, one of his favorite moments in the show because he's like, all the girls are just like, yes, yes, yes. Oh, do you hear what she said? Oh my God. And he's like, just watching them kind of like fangirl out. And we had uh, some, uh, when we were on tour, we were in Reno, Nevada, and there was like a group of, I think six teenagers who came and they were like really dressed up. And, um, and I was like out at stage door or whatever. And they were like, tonight's actually our prom, but we didn't want to miss the show. So we came here instead of prom and I was like, what? That's so amazing. And so I was like, we're taking a prom picture. So I have it. It's so cool. I made us like all get into like an awkward like prom line. We were all like just like prom picture together, but it was like a whole snake of like all seven of us like in a prom pose. That was the best. And then on Broadway, last one, um, I came out one time and there was like a group of just cuckoo fans. They, I know a few of them had seen the show multiple, multiple, multiple times and they would always bring back more people and it was always like incredible. And one time they were just like, I came out and they just started singing at the top of their lungs. It was like at least 10 people singing my grand plan. And they sang the entire song as I'm like going down the line. And I was like, this is surreal. This is just absolutely out of control. And this is a song that you recorded for an album and like have gotten to sing since it was written and it was written for you. Totally. So. I know. Totally crazy. When we were recording the album, we were freaking out. We were like, people are going to listen to this. And that one, so much pressure because you're just like, this is how everyone will know and learn these songs. These are the vowels that everyone will listen to. And you're like, if I do something weird or whatever, like, that's it. It's recorded forever. It's so permanent. You're just like, oh, my God. But, like, we, I mean, we were freaking out. We're like, this is, this is about to be, like, permanent right now. It, it was so cool. Have you noticed that a lot of people, I feel like, online sing My Grand Plan for audition songs? That they have like a lot of young students I've noticed. Yes, everyone is singing that song. And I mean, it's a great, it's a great song. And I think everyone's singing it because one, it's fun, two, it's a really cool character. But I, I think it's because there's like so few songs out there that are age appropriate, you know, for kids and teens and young adults and whatever. Um, that is exciting to see. And then it's not a love song. It's not about like, I like this boy or whatever. Like I'm actually, I'm teaching, um, uh, a, like a class series right now. And I have 10 students in my class. They're like ages. Um, I think the youngest is 14, but they're all like 16, 17 ish. And I wanted to stay really true and assign them songs that they could sing that are like kind of more age appropriate. And like, Every girl song is about, except for I assigned Sonia alone from Natasha Pierre, and that's not about a guy. It's about her friend, so thank God for that. But I think all of the other ones, they're all about, like, I like this boy. Yeah, and not about, like, the girl. Are you kidding me right now? So I think that's also why people are drawn to it. It's just, like, talking about being awesome and badass, you know? Yeah, and go ahead and, like, reaching your goals in life like yeah. Yeah. going to accomplish what you want to accomplish and oh. not relying on someone else absolutely it is a statement piece yes i love that so much so uh what was what's been the most memorable part of being part of lightning thief 
And how would you persuade someone to bring it back to Broadway when Broadway reopens after quarantine and after all this mess that we're going, that's happening right now? Oh my gosh. The most memorable part. And how do I get someone to like bring it back? Oh my gosh. Um, well, one, I think it's, you know, the fan base keeps growing. People are still just hearing about the show. So it is still like a fresh baby new show um, in a lot of people's eyes. And so there's a lot of legs. There's a lot of room with that. Also, you know, to be totally honest, because we had such a short window of time between tour ending and when our Broadway run was about to start because we got that space because theaters are booked out years in yeah. advance huge waiting list and so our producers were really smart really savvy and as soon as the prom closed r.i.p love you um they contacted the theater and they're like do you have someone moving in and they're like yes we have this show called diana it's moving in january 2020 um but we have the fall open and so they're like okay we'll take it so we basically were like this is the this is our time period we cannot go past this time and to get the maximum amount of time we got to start almost immediately so because of that there were no changes from the tour yeah. to Broadway. and i think that's something that we all would have really have loved is to make a show for the long acre theater you know to know the house that we were going to be in to know that we could drill into the stage and make effects come up you know we didn't have the time you know, or the resources given to us to actually create the show for that space. So that would be another reason why I'd want to have the show go back is because we we had so many great ideas that were like, ha ha ha, well, we're on Broadway, we'll do this, like as a joke. And then when we found ourselves there, we were like, oh, now we can't do any of that because we had to do it for so many different sized houses on tour, we really minimized it. Um, let's see, what was my most... What was the question? What was the most memorable, most memorable moment from any part of being part of the cast? Oh, golly. You earned a Drama Desk nomination, I saw. Yeah, that was pretty That's amazing. That was cool because we found that out the day we were recording the album. And like, when you're recording an album, it's not like, oh, it's on your like, you know, oh, we've had like a bunch of days to vocally recover and oh, let's have three days to record and it's very luxurious. No, they're like you. It was like our final week of shows or something crazy. It was like a nine show week. They like were squeezing so many shows in. And then on Wednesday, which is not a normal day off, they made it our day off. And so I think we had like two weeks in a row without a day off in order to get the day off. And then we were recording all day we only had those like 12 hours to record it was very stressful you're like so vocally exhausted and you're like um what am i doing and so but also like really fun and uh, we were like oh my god da, da, da. and then like towards the end of the day someone was like um you guys we were just nominated for drama desk best musical and we were like were those today what like did not expect a drama desk nomination at all we were just shocked we were like this is huge this is incredible and it was it was amazing we got to perform we got to be there for the awards and like people nominated that year um were hades town the yeah. band visit um us um who were the other musicals was the prom that year too no they weren't there for the drama desk I actually don't know. I think they just went straight to Broadway. Yeah, I think they might have. Well, anyway. they were in Atlanta, I think, pre. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I can't remember which other ones were there, but we were like, it, this is, and then it was like other Broadway shows that we were nominated against too, because Drama Desk is both off Broadway and Broadway. It's yeah. the best New York theater. And we were like, oh my wow. God, that was crazy huge. And I would say, I mean, there were so many amazing moments. Um, Opening night was incredible to be like, we did it. We put the show on our backs because when there's only a cast of seven, there is no one to fall back on. I mean, this is kind of going to your, um, what we were talking about a little bit about stamina. 
you know, when you have a full Broadway company, you have the ensemble, you have the secondary characters, you have the lead. And yeah, the leads like have a lot of the pressure, but there's also, you know, it's a whole support network. Everyone is working really hard, but there's a lot of people, there's sets, there's lights, there's, ah, there's a lot of stuff to kind of help carry that energy. When you have seven people only on stage, all that energy is on you. So to, and to be with the show for as long as I had been, and then Sarah Beth was like the second longest person. And then, you know, it was Chris and James, and then, you know, Jarrell, Jalen and Ryan. For all of us to make it to opening night of Broadway was super crazy. And the last memory I wanted yes. to- There's gotta be so many. It's, I mean, honestly, there's so, 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 so many. It's, you know, it's like six years, six years yeah. of movie memories. Um, but it was really special when we were on tour. We were in um, Fort Lauderdale. Is that where we were? Right. And we actually got to perform with, um, what's the school called? Mallory Stoneman Douglas School. Oh, yeah, yeah. We were the school that had that big school shooting the year before we were on tour. Um, and um, they got a special edition, like, okay uh, for them to perform The Lightning Thief at their school. And so we toured, and they came and joined us for, like, the final number, and we got to sing with them. And so we, like, you know, got to be with our, like, counterparts and, like, it was so special, and um, the girl who played Annabeth actually won. We were like, we could be sisters. Who are you? Yeah. So amazing, so cute, and and you know, and these are kids who had their lives changed. I mean, one of her good friends, you know, died from that shooting, and it was just such a powerful moment. We were like, oh my god, I could get emotional talking about it, but <laughs> we were we were doing the show, and. Um, it came and we knew that they were in the audience watching us that night and it came to tree on the hill oh my god i'm gonna start crying and it came to tree on the hill when grover's talking about watching his friends get murdered and we were all on stage just like stopping trying to hold it together i was like i'm a tree right now but just weeping just un it was just all of a sudden just hit home the circumstances and you just realize who's watching in the audience and just how important, you know, this story is. I mean, it's a ridiculous story. It's, you know, it's ridiculous. We are like flying shoes. We're at the underneath all that silliness is some really, really real themes of acceptance of, you know, um, where do I belong? I mean, learning disabilities, stepping into your power, dealing with loss. Um, it's just, you know, it, it was just really hit home that moment. So that was a really, really special moment, I would say. And I love shows like that where it's like, yes, the purpose of the show is to entertain, but like, yes, it's also real. At the, at yeah. The yeah, yeah, for sure. Speaking of wild storylines, I want to know if you could pick any Greek mythology character. I know there's Hades Stone right now too. To make into a, to and write like a story about them and a mu whole musical about them. What Greek mythology character would it be? Oh my gosh! I mean, oh golly, there's so many. I mean, there's obviously like Icarus and Daedalus. That's a huge story. Um, I mean, this is directly me taking from like the Lightning, the Percy Jackson books, but I always loved um, Calypso. Oh. Um, her father uh, is atlas i believe and like you know in i think i could be totally getting this wrong but you know he's the one who's like holding the entire world up and he was he's doing that as like punishment because he like betrayed the gods and you know in the books and percy jackson at least you know he meets calypso and she's on her island because she's basically been banished 
and it's a really cool moment where you like this girl and she's like so cool and like down to earth and they get along so well and then it's not till the end that he realizes like oh she's technically the enemy and i think that would be a really special story to tell especially in these times when people can be so torn and black and white and you know finding kind of like forgiveness and understanding between you know both sides yes we need the unison a unison mm -hmm. storyline yeah. would be amazing right now yeah absolutely so kind of going back to the lightning thief real quick what's the funniest thing that ever happened on stage during the show i mean do we have another hour everything <laughs> just everything could happen because listen when you build a show where like um ridiculousness ridiculousness is like reign supreme you're just gonna have that happen throughout the show and you're just gonna be making each other break and you're gonna be like laughing like oh my god what just like ridiculous things um let's see mm, let me think of a handful uh one time chris <laughs> this was at the lord's hell one time this was like at the end of um uh you know bring on the monsters and in the choreography you know so we have this like scaffolding this like building scaffolding in the back that you can like climb up and down on. and there's like three little like kind of bars and crossbars and you can like stand on it like this but you know it's like a narrow bar yeah and so we're like on the front of the stage and we're like bang on the real world and we pivot turn and run to the back of the stage and then we're supposed to like jump on the scaffolding and like spin and hang around to the audience and then jump back off and da 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 it's like two eight counts it's very fast <laughs> I look over I like run to the back I'm like hopping on my bar and then I like spin out to like look at the audience and then I like see Chris next to me and he has like so this is like the bar Chris is like totally missed and he's like oh like when you're on like a bar and he was just like tangled up in the bar he was falling he was dangling and then he like quickly untangled himself and then like landed back in his spot and I was a mess I was a mess I could not stop laughing um there was this was towards the end of the show the, like the end of our run this was like on broadway um i started to like i don't know what happened we were joking that it was like oh the robot has reached the maximum amount of times that like i could do this show because i would just start saying a line it happened like three times i started with to say a line and then i could not remember the next word. So then I would start improvising what I thought the line was. And I was like, what's happening? I This is not me at all. And, um, and one time I like forgot the line. This was like on a um, two show day in the matinee. It was like some long paragraph. Oh, it was in um, Drive. It was when we were like, uh chris sees bianca and he's like oh look the lotus hotel let's go there and i'm supposed to be like are you kidding me in the odyssey if you you know spent the night in a lotus bed you could be you know asleep for a hundred years or whatever the line is but i can't remember now and i literally got to that point and i was like are you serious if you are in a bed from the lotus it's like thousands of years that you could be sleeping and, and i was just you know, what <laughs> Because there's only like a certain amount of music that I had, and Chris was like, just watching. Also, don't do anything in front of Chris McCarroll because he will break. He has no like filter. Anytime I would mess up, he'd be like, and I'm like, will you stop telegraphing to people that I like don't know what's happening? So, okay. So then the next show, and I think I always got razzed because otherwise I was perfect all the time everyone else was always like Bleh. and so whenever i would do like a small thing people would be like ah -ha! so in the second show it came to that point and i like was crossing you know to one side of the stage and one of the stage managers 
had taken huge piece of like butcher paper, like really long and wrote out the entire line, like a giant cue card on the side of the stage. And I was like, I will kill you. I will kill you right now. How am I supposed to keep a straight face? With that, yeah. It was ridiculous. I mean, there was so much foolishness that went on in that show. It's, uh, it's unbelievable. We were, let's just say we were having just as good of a time as everyone else. We were like, hopefully the audience is having as much fun as we are on stage. I mean, well, when they see the cast having fun on stage and you can tell when the cast is having fun on stage, the audience always has just as much fun. Totally, totally. And it kept things fresh too, you know. Yeah. Live theater, it's always it's always new every night. Nothing's the same. There's different audience, different things happen. Totally, totally. And it sounds like you all got the chance to kind of improv a bit. <laughs> so. Yes, we definitely all got to have our moments where we had like a little bit of like wiggle room to do things, which was really fun. Yeah. So obviously it doesn't get much better than originating a role. But what's your dream role that maybe is in existence? Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Well, um, as far as like a um, kind of current role, I'd really love to do Jenna in Waitress. Oh. That'd be so much fun. At first I was like, oh, I'm more of a Don, blah, 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 blah. but I'd really love to do Jenna. She's so, it's just such a really fun, great role. Um, such great songs. Um, and then other than that, I mean, so many shows. I'm a huge Steven Sondheim fan, so I'd love to play Dot in Sunday in the Park with George, um, or really any any roles in any of the Steven Sondheim shows. They're all pretty amazing. I could see you singing the Jenna songs really well. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> they really match. They really match your voice really, really well. So hopefully, waitress will come back and that will happen. That'd be cool. So in an industry that's this tough and like, I'm sure you get told no multiple times when you're auditioning because mm -hmm. everyone does, it happens. And like, you kind of have to face it at a certain point, but it's hard. How do you, how do you uh, keep up the self-confidence and like grow your self-confidence? Oh, golly. Just a question you have to ask yourself every day. Um, you know, it's not personal. That's what it is. It's really not personal. Like there's good auditions, there's bad auditions, but sometimes you could have what you think is a horrible audition and you get the role. Like sometimes it really does not matter. You're coming, there's so many other circumstances at play when you walk into a room that I think that is the constant mantra, honestly, that I have to remind myself of too. Cause sometimes I'll just really want something so bad. And it's like, it does. It does not matter. It doesn't matter. There's, you know, as long as you're serving the story, that's all you can really do and know that that's kind of what their main purpose is as well. Because, you know, there could be like just really weird things that you have no control of. All you have control of is like going into the room and making some art in front of some people and then being like, okay, and that's what I did. And then you have to like let it go, which I have not mastered. I'm not saying this because I'm like, I am the master of like doing that. Train ride homes for me, like some auditions I'm like totally fine on, some train rides I'm like so neurotic. I'm like, wait, what did I sound like? Blah, blah, blah. And of course, like you don't actually know how the audition went. It's yeah. like, sometimes you're just like, I part of me has blacked out. I don't know what happened, <laughs> you know? So you leave and you're just like, okay, well I'm on the train. How did I, how am I imagining that? that went because that's the other thing like you you don't actually know how it happened so it's kind of like just take all those thoughts out of your brain whether you think it was good or bad it doesn't matter we're our own worst enemy normally so it's like we overthink everything that we do and it's like what if i did this wrong and like what if i did this like mini thing wrong and it's like i'm sure you even had those moments in lightning thief when you were when you judged yourself a little too hard and people oh my god like, i messed up this part and people were like you did when totally oh my god i am the queen of just of like going home and like every night bed thinking about how i could do my grand plan better 
like obsessively, I would just be like, how can I make that note better? How do I do those vowels so I can hit that note better? What's this acting be? How can I be more specific? Or like just running through the entire show, I can just get, I can absolutely get super obsessive because I always want to, I always want to be improving. You know, I always want to be thinking about how I can be better and how I could be making my character better for sure. And that's good, but there's also like, Mm, too much and so sometimes I dip into that for sure so obviously you have a lot of experience in this industry and you mentioned teaching earlier so I want to touch on where can people contact you if they want to uh like sign up for voice lessons or anything with you yeah um so follow me on Instagram if you don't already that's like where I'm the most active I have all my like latest projects and things going on um but i am hooked up through broadway plus so i teach a lot of you know one-on-one -on -one classes with them also stage door um which is uh broadway world that's more like shout out videos and stuff like that so um through broadway plus they can uh connect with me and that's amazing getting to like watch students grow and grow it must feel so good to get to like teach them and get to watch them grow week to week Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right now I'm teaching at a theater company. So it's definitely more like I have these 10 students that I'm with for the next 10 weeks. And so I honestly, I love nothing more than teaching and process and working on songs and monologues with people. It's just so, so, so fun for me. And they get to learn from someone who knows the industry. So what better yeah. way to learn? <laughs> exactly. So what are you most excited about when theater is able to come back? Just to do it again, <laughs> to be around, <laughs> to be around all my friends and creating in a space. And, you know, I think um, this is actually something Chris McCarroll and I talk about a lot. And this is kind of his like motivating thing is he's like, people are going to be so ready to be in an audience and want to connect with people. They're going to be seeking that out. And that's, I mean, that's what theater is. It's a place to bring community, community together, whether you're on stage or you're in the audience, we're all having a shared experience in real time, in the moment, nothing has been pre-recorded. It's all actually happening in front of us. Um, and the way, you know, the people in the audience, like you were saying, like that affects the performance and the energy and what's going on for everyone in their day-to-day -day lives. And so I'm just really excited to get back with people again and be creating. And I think, um, you know, it's going to be really exciting when everything opens up again. I'm really excited to see what kind of art and what kind of stories people want to be telling after this. I hope um, that it's there's like new and different things that are about to happen. Of course, I love revivals and things like that. I'm all for it, but I, I'm i really looking forward to seeing what kind of new theater is created. TikTok musicals. <laughs> TikTok music. I mean, hello, there you go. The big thing right now, I, I mean, that's gonna be huge after this whole thing ends. There's gonna be a bunch of TikTok grow, like created musicals in the theaters. <laughs> totally. So, lastly, uh, is there anything else you have to promote and where can people follow you on social media to keep up with everything? Yeah, so you can follow me on Instagram. My name is Chitty Balone. That's C-H-I-T-T-Y underscore B-A-L-O-N-E. That's <laughs> Nickname, my alter <laughs> ego name. Um, and, uh, you know, that's where everything's happening. Every Saturday, I have an um, Instagram live that I do called Chitty Chat. Oh. And I get together with all my Broadway buddies, and we're in our PJs with our coffee mugs, and we're just, you know, hanging out and talking. And so it's a really great way to, like, just come and find you know community again and just hang out with us there's i always reveal my like special guest on thursdays and there's of course opportunities for you to ask them questions but um yeah every saturday 9 30 a.m pacific time which is 12 30 p.m eastern time love that 
as I said at the very beginning, theater people are resilient. And, and we will find a way, yeah. <laughs> Always. Well, thank you so much for joining me to talk on this. It was such a blast. Oh my God, so fun. Thanks for having me, Becca. Thanks for watching this episode of Backstage with Becca B. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Becca B Talks TV. Or for more exclusive content from this interview and more, you can follow me on Instagram and Facebook at Backstage with Becca B. Make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Or if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, go ahead and give me a five-star rating. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye!